Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another message from Fountain Springs Church. My name is Kevin, and I'm on staff at FSC. I'm glad you're joining not just me, but our in-person and online locations worshiping God together. Today, we are going to hear last week's message from one of our pastors. And spoiler alert, it's been shortened a bit to be broadcasted here on your screen. If you want to listen to the whole message, go to our website at messages.fs.church to listen to it all. Again, we are glad you're joining us. So we as a church have been doing this, very simple. You and I have a tendency to drift from the things that are important. You might say, this is a big deal. And then later on, you're like, why don't I treat that like a big deal? And you drift away from it. It's human nature. Like, this is what we do. Then you amplify that, but not sometimes it's just something, it's someone. Someone that you have said, I want to be close to them. I want to be all about them. I want to be in their life. And then you find that your schedule doesn't seem to indicate at all that that someone is someone you want to be very close to. This is directly relevant to God. Many of us, just by the nature of us being like in church listening, how are you doing this? Like God is something to you, whether you're seeking him or fully devoted to him. But you have to admit, at least I will as a reverend, that there are days, weeks, even sometimes longer, that I feel distant from God because I've drifted from him because I've not prioritized him. Or in our language, I've not put down anchors. And life pulled me away. So this whole series has been about anchors, about what can you and I do to not drift from God because God's not drifting from you. You catching me? Okay. So to the point, here's another anchor. If you've missed all of them, go watch it on the internet. Uh, This week's anchor, prayer, a conversation with God. Now I'm in dangerous territory right now because some of us like, prayer, I got that one. I know how to do that. I'd do that. So if you're willing, I think you and all can, we we learn from this. I'm going to test you to see if you're willing. Let me give you a quote. This will help us get get really going. Corey Tim Boom, if you don't know who she is, survived a a Nazi concentration camp. So if you want like, so who is this? Okay. Uh, Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? This is why I'm going to get to the point, okay? So, and if you're like, I don't know what that means. Let me help you a little bit. Uh, is it, are your conversations with God such a priority that based on your conversations with God, that's how you do life? You, you drive life like that? Or are your conversations with God when all of a sudden you hear a rumble in the back rear passenger tire, so you got to get the spare tire, and you're like, God, I need you now, right? That's, that's what she's getting to much quicker than I just did. One classic sentence. Let's go to the Bible and just see a few examples. Very simple. Uh, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Note that early Christians, the confidence they had in God was not that that he would do everything that they wanted him to do, which, come on. We all would have, we got a list. If all of a sudden God's like, you give me your top 10 and I'll accomplish it within 30 seconds. You're like, yes, thank you very much. But look at what they loved about him. Was it that he heard them? That was cool enough for them. Listen, if you're wondering right now, the things that you've said to God, maybe you even indirectly said them to God and you wonder, did he hear me? Is he hearing me? Have I been good enough, nice enough? Have I, have I done all the things in line and in order and such that he would hear me? That doesn't disqualify you. He's just listening. He's listening to anything and everything you ever want to speak to him about. It's really cool. We'll keep going though because we got a little more to learn. If, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, I'll come back to that. That's an important part of the verse and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Okay, I'm going to talk to the super church people right now. If you're super church, please listen very closely. I get spoken this verse to me a lot of times. It's usually in the context that uh, the current state of our nation, which we're not doing so hot, okay? It's not, it's not our finest hour as Americans, Okay, I often get told, David, if we would just pray, it'd fix it all. And I use this verse. Listen, I disagree. Because that verse doesn't just say pray. It starts off with, 
we got to humble ourselves. And perhaps that's the biggest problem. Then we got to turn from our wicked ways. And doing that, humbling ourselves and turning from our wicked ways, brings you into natural conversation with God. So do I believe prayer is powerful? You better believe it. I'm preaching a sermon on it. But I think I should correct some theology right now that many of us, we want our nation and our world to be fixed. And we think it's just the one thing. It's a mixture of things, but yes, it does require and involve conversations with God. If you go uh, into the New Testament here, watch and pray, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Listen, if some of you right now are just so frustrated with your own self because you keep doing what you wish you'd stop doing, or you keep saying what you wish you'd stop saying, or you keep thinking in ways that you, you wish you'd quit thinking that way, and you're like, what do I do? What's the tactic? What website? What blog? What podcast? Pray. If you want to fight temptation, and you're currently doing all the tactical stuff, yet you're not having conversations with God, I'll tell you, start having conversations with God along with the other tactical stuff. So you ready for a quiz? Not on the stuff I've talked to you about. Don't worry about that. Some of you are like, what? No. I want you to find yourself in these three words. When you think about your conversations with God, your prayer, now don't tell anybody because some of us might get embarrassed. But... Uh, when you think about the way you talk to God, the, the frequency or the style, or it, you get to come up with your own answers here. Uh, just let me go through these words and see what describes you. And, and you just, I want you just locking on to an answer, okay? That's your only job. That's the only part of this test. Would you say that your conversations with God, your prayer life, your prayer time are very intentional? I mean, some of you are like, oh yeah, David, 6 a.m. every day. And then you have like certain times and all that. Okay, okay, you're, you're super intentional. Some of you are like, not so much. I'm more of a hippie, right? You're, it's more random. It's sometimes, but it's not all the time, right? That kind of, okay, just I'm, you find yourself in this, I told you. And some of you are like, no, I've been waiting for you to bring up emergency because that is my, that's my life. When something bad comes your direction, whether it's relational or physical or whatever, you're like, God, I, did, you, did you see that? And you want him involved in your emergency or someone else's emergency. Have you found yourself yet? Yeah? Would you like the real answer? I think you should have all three. I would tell you to have a thriving relationship with God. What should prayer look like as an anchor? I would contend that you should have some intentional because every relationship requires intentional stuff, right? If you're unintentional with all your relationships, let me be kind and say you're not very good at it, right? There should be some ounce of intentionality, but there also should be some randomness, where you're like out and about and you're just walking around, all of a sudden you start thinking about so-and-so and they're not around you. They didn't just text you. You just got their name and you're like, what in the world? Maybe that's the Holy Spirit saying, I know this is weird to you, but I'd like for you to start praying for that person. It's random. It's not all the time. It's not every day. And then the emergency stuff we get. Uh, Many times as a family, we've been driving, and like you, then, then traffic slows down and slows down. You're super angry, and you're like, this world is coming to an end. And then you realize, oh, someone has an accident, and you feel like a jerk. And, and then you're thinking, so what do I do? And as a parent, I'm constantly thinking, what do I do? And these are the moments that, that this emergency that this person is obviously feeling and experiencing. One of the great things you can do as a family is like, let's pray for this person. It's not our emergency. It's their emergency. But let's pray for them. What I'm telling you is if you want to have this anchor in your life, you should say, I need all three. That's why you and I don't need to just say, hey, go pray and figure it out. There's a bit of relational factor to it. You see that? So I want to, I want to deal with two questions. They're the reason is they're the top questions I get asked. Who am I praying to and, and how should I pray? Now, the reason no one really comes up to me is like, hey, which God should I pray? That they know my answer. But when they ask, like, can I talk to God about? And then they fill in the blank. 
Well, what that tells me is you're not exactly sure who you're praying to. Because who you're praying to, if you know who he is, you know all the things that you can talk to him about. So let's start with who am I praying to? And I'm going to give you three big words. Not for the sake of giving you big words, but they'll be helpful for you to understand who you're praying to. First one is, God is omnipotent. So some of you are like, I'm not writing down omnipotent. I'm going to write down David's description of it, all powerful. But I, I think it's important for us to get educated should you ever read about this. God is omnipotent. It means he's all powerful. He's not limited in any sense of the power word. Isaiah 14, the Lord of heaven's armies has spoken. Who can change his plans? That's not the writer going, no, really, who? The writer's actually making a statement, <laughs> going, nobody. When his hand is raised, who can stop him? Let's go to uh, another big word. God is omnipresent, literally present everywhere. I know we use terms now, and boy, I really felt like God was there. True. But even in the dark spaces, well, here, Psalm 139, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Some of you are like, oh, no. No, don't, don't, oh, no, that, okay? I know, I know someone was like, he knows. Yeah, he knows, but don't worry about it. Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father, who sees everything, will reward you. I love, that gives you description. I will have no idea what you do in your house. I love that God is so powerful, yet so aware that wherever you are, whether it's a bad situation or a good situation, whether you've been really, really naughty. I have a three-year-old in the house. Whether you've been naughty or you've been nearly angelic, God sees you. And you need to be reminded of that. I'll show you a, a last one, okay? God is omniscient, which means he's all-knowing. This is what stirs some of us up. We're like, I know, that's what I struggle with. Psalm 139, I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. First John 3.20, even if we feel guilty. God is greater than our feelings. I need to do a sermon on that. That's what you're going to title. God is greater than our feelings. God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. So God's awesome. That's the summary. Now, step two, how should I pray? I think this is what gets a lot of us hung up, because we're not sure that we're, for lack of better words, that we're doing it right. When you and I have a conversation with someone, specifically if you want to put in the context of maybe you're thinking about talking to that girl or whatever, there's two ways you can go about it. And the first way is you can go to give, where your intent is to give, in this case, her, a listening ear. Where your intent is actually, and this will blow some of your minds, to learn about the other person. You're not writing this down. You ought to. Your goal is not to be heard, it's to hear. That's relational. Most of you are like, yeah, yeah, isn't that what we all do? No. Because the other option is to start the conversation in order to get. Let me summarize. You can either go to give or to get. Relational, transactional. But the reason that many of us find prayer ineffective is because we've treated it as though it's transactional. And if you treat all relationships as though they're transactional, guess what you can find out about relationships? They won't work for you. I think Jesus taught us a prayer that was all about relationship and not just the words that were in the prayer. You're probably familiar with the Lord's Prayer, right? Lord's Prayer? Ah, here. I'm going to read this, and some of you are going to have, like, 
the hardest time of your life not saying it out loud because it's memorized. Uh, pray like this. This is Jesus in a sermon. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we also, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. This is the Lord's Prayer. Some of you have it memorized. And you're like, yeah, that's, that's our Harry Potter spell book. Hold on to that thought. I think some of us are treating the Lord's Prayer as it's something that's the only thing we can speak because Jesus, when asked, how do we pray, or even included in the sermon, he said, pray like this. So we're like, we got to pray those exact words. If we deviate from those words, we've screwed up, and he doesn't like us. I disagree. In fact, I've reworded the Lord's Prayer out of danger. I know some of you are like, what? Jesus did not mess up but I want you to understand what he was saying. Here's what he was saying. This is, pray like, pray like this. God, I'm not in this alone. Remember, our father, not my father. Our our collective. God, I'm not in this alone. You are the almighty, holy God. You are him. Uh, You have my allegiance. I don't know if they still do it in all schools, but I remember growing up, You started the day basically swearing your allegiance to the nation, right? Why would we not do that to our God? Just thinking out loud logically. You have my allegiance. You know what is best. You have all authority. Those two lines I don't like, okay? There's a lot of times like, God, I know you know what's best, but I have an alternative idea that I think still meshes with what you might think about. And no, it's, it's difficult to talk to God and say, I know you know what's best and you got all authority, but I'd like to do my thing. Then watch this. And some, this may be something you guys have missed. I don't know. Uh, I need you to provide for my body. Remember in the prayer, um, I need food. I need you to provide it. I need you to provide for my soul. I need forgiveness. I need you to provide for my mind. Not only do I need forgiveness, I'm going to need some help forgiving my coworker. And I'm going to need wisdom and discernment on fighting the devil. That sounds like mind stuff. And I need you to fight for me. What I would contend is when Jesus taught us how to pray, he was saying, talk to me relationally. Those are relational words, mind, body, and soul. I believe with all my heart that Jesus wasn't given us like this spell. It's an invitation to a relationship. That when you and I are having conversations with God, yes, there are books of prayer that are fantastic. Because if you're like me, sometimes I don't have the words that connect to my feelings, so I need help with words, right? But don't miss that it actually was an invitation to belong to him, to connect to him, to become like him. It's a big deal. Now, why does he want to be in a relationship with you? Here's my conclusion, and I think it has merit. Uh, You don't go into battle with casual acquaintances. If you're going to have the fight of your life, Do you want to involve a God that you don't even spend time with and don't even know? Some of you are like, yeah, I still do. (laughs) Then make it a bit more personal. If you're about to have the fight of your life, are you going to go up to some random stranger on the sidewalk somewhere and say, hey, I need your help? No, because you don't know him. What I would conclude is this prayer is not some like ritualistic thing that we're trying to achieve in order to get God to like us. It's this relational aspect of conversations. So let me give you some basics on prayer. Very basic. Basics on prayer. If you want to know like how to pray, um, this is a good lead statement. God lead me. Okay? Uh, Psalm 31. But I am trusting you, O Lord, saying you are my God. You are my God. I am not God. You are my God. You lead me. Psalm 23. Classic version. The Lord is my shepherd. Just stop for a second. You're not your own shepherd. He is. I have all that I need. He lets me rest. He leads me. He renews me. 
He guides me along the right path, bringing honor to his name. Lord, lead me. If you were a part of our, our series where we unpacked when Jesus said to his disciples, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And we talked about the first part, come follow me, being our approach to exalting God. If you want to know the literal way to practice this, this out, this approach, if you want to live your life purpose to exalt God, one of the most practical ways to do that is with prayer, starting your day and as often throughout your day and night, God, lead me. You are greater than me. You are more powerful. You are all-knowing, and you are everywhere. God, lead me. This is a fantastic way to literally apply Scripture. Now, give me some practical ones. Here's practical stuff. If you, those of you who like, like, tell me what to do. Okay. Uh, start in your day with prayer. Some of you are like, well, I, want, I should do more. Well, if you're doing nothing, do this first. Start the day and end the day. As you progress, pray with the person. Here's what I mean. Some of us who are like super Christians, right? People come up to you and you're like, hey, will you pray for? And you're like, yes, I will. And have you ever forgotten? Do you want me to have you raise your hands? I'm not going to. When someone comes up to you and says, hey, will you pray for? I have a suggestion. Say yes and do it right there. Now, some of you are like, but there's people. Yeah. You're like, what do I say? I'll give you the words. God, help him. Amen. <laughs> if you think God can't do something with that, you're praying to the wrong God. Here's one that's been instrumental to me is write it down. Uh, I was talking to my mom not too long ago, and she was like, hey, I need, I want to, my, my time with the Lord is just kind of getting a little stale. I want to do something different. And so I started years ago uh, writing down each morning prayers. So here's, what, here's what happens to me. I'll wake up, and I'm thinking on stuff, like, from the beginning moment. I have a tendency to then take what I'm thinking and throw it at the people that I love the most. Anyone else? Like the, the, the pressure of it, the tension of it. And I'll just, so what I've got to do is I've got to try to beat everybody up. Like not literally physically beat them up. Like get up before them. Get down and start writing the stuff in my head. The prayers. i got to write them down. Give them to God. So that I don't hurt other people. With my words. What's cool is I use a journal that's called the five-year journal. I mean, I'll write like a line or two each day. And so I can look at what I prayed on this day last year and the year before and the year before. And if you want to know, is God still moving? If you write it down, you'll answer that question. Now, I'm telling you to pray, God lead me, right? I just told you, you should pray, God lead me. Well, then our church should be doing the same thing, correct? Answer is yes. Yes. So here. Uh, 24 hours of prayer in God's word, January 26th and 27th. If you're like a note taker or a calendar person, put this in. That's a Thursday night into a Friday night. Here's what we're going to do as a church. And I think it's going to happen more, but I'm just going to, this first one. Uh, Thursday night of, of that day, we are going to kick off by just worshiping for an hour. And that's going to lead into 24 straight hours of prayer in our facilities. Now at the same time, in another part of the building, we're going to have the Bible, the New Testament, specifically read out loud. If you want to know, Google says 17 hours. It'll take 17 hours. We can drag it out to 24. Don't worry about it. Because <laughs> I'm like, because I'll tell you, you're going to read the New Testament. You're like, can you read it in 24 hours? Yes. And we're going to read it out loud. Why are we doing this? Because we as a church believe God should lead us. So we're going to read his word. We're going to talk to him. And I think that's a great way to start a year. Now, listen, that's going to require over 200 people to make happen. I'll eventually give you a link where you can sign up. We've got to ask God to lead us. Uh, one last basic on prayer. It'll seem like I'm deviating from the trail, but it's important to bring up really quick. It's called fasting. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Talking about the demon. And he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. If you're currently in a state right now going, David, I've been praying. I've been praying. Nothing. See, nothing. All right. According to Jesus, Ramp it up. 
Matthew chapter 6, I love what he says because it's very convicting. Uh, and when you fast, which is, you catch the assumption. And, and when you do, wink, wink. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do for they try to look miserable. Like, don't go on social media like, I'm so hungry today. Fasting for Jesus. <laughs> don't, don't do that. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. Don't you dare do that. Now, before you think, oh, good, weight loss program, man, get close to Jesus, stop. Uh, let me show you a, just a list. Let me help you understand what fasting is, and then I want to land this sermon. Basics on prayer uh, and fasting. Uh, deny your appetite. It intensifies our focus. Anytime you deny your appetite, guess what you're doing? You're focusing yourself on what you find to be absolutely like so important, especially when it comes to food, because all of us have a tendency to want food at some part of the day. When you deny that, your focus gets honed in. Anytime I talk about fasting, I bring up my mom because she taught me quite a bit on this. And she said, fasting is starving the enemy. I love that. Because I'm like, actually, mom, I think it, I'm starving. I'm starving right now. <laughs> and what she means by when you start to deny your appetite and spend that time focused on God, the devil finds you very difficult to tempt. Uh, fasting isn't casual. And some of us struggle with this because you, we want to take a casual approach to Jesus uh, it's searching submission. It's sacrifice. It's actually saying no to something you're, even your body craves. Now, some of you are like, why would God make me want to hurt my body in order to spend time with them? Well, if you study the science of fasting, I'm not talking about starvation. If you study the science of fasting, actually it would say at portions and, and appropriate times, it's actually healthy for your body. Hmm. So let me tell you a quote, and then I want to tell you a story. Leonard Ravenhill, very popular writer on prayer. Prayer is not a preparation for the battle. It is the battle. If you don't like your answer to the prayer question earlier about emergency, random, or intentional, you're like, yeah, you've not treated it as the actual battle. We're so glad you tuned in today. Fountain Springs Church is located in the Black Hills of South Dakota, but our community reaches beyond our neighborhoods and spreads around the whole world. Our website is a great way to give, get involved, and get connected. If you appreciate our ministry and want to be part of our mission to show people who Jesus is, here's what I'd recommend. Join us financially. When you do that, you're giving other people the opportunity to hear what you just heard. So here's a way to do that. Visit our website at fs.church give. And thank you so much for being with us today. And let's do our best this week to show people who Jesus is.